This is the Borealis from Fred Olson Cruise Lines. I recently took a two week trip on the Borealis from Liverpool to Northern Norway on a winter Northern Lights hunt. And as you'll see on my other video about the trip, we succeeded. But I know many of you planning a Fred Olsen cruise are keen to find out more about the ship itself, so that's what I'll focus on in this video. Together with its sister ship, the Bolette, the Borealis is relatively new to the Fred Olsen fleet, but it's not a new vessel, far from it in fact. Fred Olsen recently bought the two ships from Holland America Line. Under its former name, the Rotterdam, the Borealis had sailed for Holland America Line for 22 years. It took its maiden voyage at the very end of 1997. So how would it be sailing in 2023 on a ship built in the 90s? Come on board and I'll show you around. I'll start with the most important factor on any cruise ship, the cabins. And yes, Fred Olsen do call a cabin a cabin and not a stateroom or other fancy name. I was in one of the more basic cabins on board, it was an ocean view cabin towards the front of deck one. I had twin portholes, but most ocean view cabins have a larger window. I'll do a full cabin tour in a separate video, so if you are interested in a full review, check that one out. Because the ship wasn't full, I was able to take a look at some of the other cabin grades. My thanks to the Future Cruise team for their help with this. First up, the ocean view room with a picture window. As I said, the majority of ocean view rooms will look like this. You only get portholes if you have a room towards the very front of deck one. There are a series of terrace cabins on deck three which open out directly onto the promenade, but higher up you will find balcony suites like this one. These share a lot in common with the ocean view cabins in terms of size, but they do feature a larger bed, more comfortable seating area, and as the name suggests, a balcony. Even in the winter, the view from the balcony can make this upgrade worthwhile, although you'll need to be wearing warm clothes out here. I also got to see an example of a premier suite, something I doubt I would ever be able to afford myself on a cruise. As you can see, the room itself, the bathroom and the balcony are all much more spacious in a premier suite than in other grades of cabin. Suites also come with the Sweet Dreams package, which includes priority check-in, a bottle of bubbly, daily fruit and canapé delivery, and a few other bits and pieces. If I had booked a premier suite, I'm pretty sure I would want to make the most of this balcony space, even in the short days of the Norwegian winter. Now that's enough about the cabins for now, so let's take a look at the rest of the ship. The ship has 10 decks and they are named as well as numbered. Deck 3 is the promenade deck, named because of the covered promenade that you can walk around and around and around. Three full laps of the promenade deck is about one mile and I saw a lot of people throughout the cruise clocking up their steps this way. The covered promenade was especially beneficial on this cruise to the north of Norway in January as it really helped protect you from the wind while still being able to enjoy the views. Covering decks three to five, the atrium is built around this wonderful clock tower. It's here you'll find the guest services as well as the excursion desk. Decks four and five are really the beating heart of the ship, as it's here you'll find the Neptune Lounge Theatre, the main restaurant and many of the shops, bars and lounges on board. The Neptune Lounge on Deck 4 hosted many lectures and all the evening shows. It's also where people meet for excursions when in port. While there is no bar inside the lounge, table service is offered before the evening performances. There is also seating space up on the balcony, which you access from Deck 5. At the other end of the ship are the main restaurants, named Aurora and Borealis. This is perhaps the largest single space on the ship and one of the few places outside the theatre where you see a lot of people in the same place at once. There are two set times for dinner and you'll sit on the same table each evening. There are also two performances in the theatre each evening timed to coincide with the end of each dinner service. 
Between the theatre and restaurants on decks four and five are a whole lot of interesting nooks and crannies to explore, along with a lot of artwork. Starting with deck four, there is the auditorium. This is slightly hidden away, but it's an important room. The auditorium hosted cookery demonstrations, film screenings, talks from the crew from the spa, uh, smaller talks, and even ukulele lessons throughout the cruise. Deck four is also home to one of the specialty restaurants called Colors and Tastes. This Asian fusion restaurant comes at an extra charge, but having eaten here, I would say it is well worth it. The menu changed several times during the cruise, so you could feasibly come here more than once if you wanted to pay. On my trip, the ship was about 60% full. There were usually tables available in both the specialty restaurants every evening. Even so, it's a good idea to book these early. Deck 5 is the lounge deck and very aptly named because it's here you will find many of the most comfortable bars and lounges on board. Much of the deck is taken up by the Morning Light pub and lounge. This is the main lounge on the ship and one that played host to trivia, bingo and other popular games throughout the trip. You'll notice it is very quiet as I'm filming this video, but that's just because I chose the quietest possible times to film. That being said, it was usually absolutely no problem to get a seat in whichever lounge you wanted. The busiest times on deck five were right before dinner and the evening shows. The piano bar was popular later in the evening when a pianist would provide the entertainment, while the oriental tea room was an elegant, quieter spot that held occasional tea tastings. Table service is offered from the bars in all of these lounges. My preferred spot, I think, was the Ocean Bar. While it was rarely as quiet as you can see right now, I did find it a peaceful spot for most of the journey, especially during the daytimes, and especially if you could grab a window table. During the evening, there was also live music and dancing here. Regular bridge teaching sessions and competitions took place in the Ballet card room, while a well-stocked library was on offer, although the opening hours for accessing the books were a little limited. Finally, on deck five is the Bookmark Cafe, another favorite spot of mine. While tea and coffee was always free from the buffet restaurant, Bookmark served premium teas and coffees at an additional charge. There were also plenty of chocolates on offer for those with a sweet tooth. Deck six is mostly cabins, but there was this wonderful outside space at the front of the ship, which turned into a real hidden gem on our trip. The reason? It was directly below the bridge. So when we were sailing at night, it was one of the darkest spots on the ship. That meant that we enjoyed scenic views during the day, but it was also ideal for spotting the Northern Lights by night. Deck 7 is also mostly cabins, but it is also home to the bridge, which I was fortunate enough to get to visit to interview the captain for an episode of the Life in Norway show, which you can listen to here. Deck 8 is the Lido deck, and as with many other cruise ships, it's here you'll find the swimming area and the buffet restaurant. The swimming pool was used more than I had expected, although it was closed at times due to occasional rough seas. It was January in Norway after all. This area has a retractable roof, which I imagine gives it a completely different feel when sailing elsewhere in the world, especially during the summer. The buffet restaurant known as The View is where I ate most of my meals. At the time of my cruise, it was not self-service, but it was simple enough to ask for what you wanted and there was rarely a wait at any point. In addition to the three standard meal times, the buffet was also open for afternoon tea and for a late night supper club. That was perfect for a quick bite and a cup of tea after being out in the cold watching for the Northern Lights. There were only a couple of times when seating was difficult to find, such as breakfast immediately before excursions began, but there were always crew on hand to help you find a seat. I only had to share a table with others two or three times over the whole two week period. In one corner of the buffet restaurant, you'll find the other specialty restaurant, Vasco. This specializes in Goan cuisine, 
and I think I enjoyed my meal here more than any other meal I had on board. After the food, it seems an appropriate time to take a look at the spa and fitness centre. While I didn't use the facility on my trip, I did get the opportunity to take a quick look around. Inside you'll find a hair salon, a well-equipped fitness centre with plenty of space for classes and weight training. There is a thermal suite and various treatment rooms. Crew from the spa also held educational sessions in the auditorium throughout the trip. At the back of deck 8 behind the buffet is this large outdoor deck. This was a popular place to be during the daytime for scenic cruising and of course at night looking for the northern lights. There is an outside bar here and a smoking area as well. Deck 9 is the sports deck, although very few sports took place here due to it being a winter cruise in Norway. Once again though, this was a popular spot for scenic cruising during the daytime and northern lights hunting when the night fell. It was windy up here of course, but it was well worth the time spent out in the cold. We got some of our best sightings of the northern lights from up here. Also on deck 9 is the observation lounge. This is typically one of my favourite spots on any ship. As with other ships, the Borealis observation lounge wraps around the front of the ship, providing a wonderful view of the scenery during the daytime. The lounge was also a popular spot for live music, drinking and dancing during the evenings, while I used it as a place to warm up in between my times out on deck hunting for the lights. The art studio is a little hidden away at the other end of deck 9, just above the buffet. In this quiet room there is plenty of space for taking part in the various arts and crafts classes offered on the cruise. I found that although the sessions just lasted one hour or so, people came early and stayed until they were finished. Last but definitely not least is the sun deck on deck 10, accessible via stairs from deck 9. There was no sun on our cruise, of course, so this became the venue for stargazing sessions and once again we enjoyed seeing the northern lights from up here. The deck was often closed due to the poor weather, but I would guess on a summer cruise this would be a very busy part of the ship. I hope you enjoyed this quick tour of the Fred Olsen Borealis. Don't forget to check out my review of the northern lights cruise itself, including how we hunted for the aurora and my best advice to those of you considering a winter Northern Lights cruise to Northern Norway. Thanks for watching.